In our last video, I said that we'd be starting on Water Street and working our way west and see if there was anything before we left uh, the side of Military Street, east of Military Street, uh, that we might have missed. And I came up with one thing, and that was this location right here at the corner of Water Street and 4th Street. And at one time, back uh, in the 1950s, there was a gas station on this corner. The photograph of this gas station is probably going to take up the whole video. And what in the world could be so important in this gas station that we'd spend a whole video on it? Well, it's not really the gas station. The picture that was taken is actually more important for what's above the gas station. And you can see in the background that there's a water spout caused by a tornado. And I would be remiss if I did not uh, do a video on the tornado of 1953 that hit Port Charm in Sarnia. If we were to zoom in and look through the window at the office area of this gas station, chances are we'd find a calendar like this one, which is quite prevalent back in the 1950s in gas stations. The date that we would look at today's date, the date that this photograph was taken, would be the 21st of May, 1953. The song you could hear coming through the open windows of the automobiles going by was how much is that doggy in the window by Patty Page? The topic of conversation around town was a woman had just broken the sound barrier. In this photo you see Jackie Cochran, who was the lady that broke the barrier, uh, along with her friend Chuck Yeager. She broke that barrier three days earlier. And if you know your history, Chuck Yeager was the first one to break that uh, barrier several years earlier. The day started out being a beautiful spring day, warm and a little humid, but really nice. Not even an inkling of the disaster that was about to come. In the afternoon, the weather changed. The temperature dropped. The skies got very dark over west of Port Huron around the Smith Creek area, which is where the tornado originally set down. The sound associated with a tornado was terrifying, described by some as if you were standing between two tracks with trains going by on both sides of you. silence as the folks of Smith Creek came out of their hiding places and looked at the damage caused by the tornado. The tornado set down about 4.30 in Smith Creek. When all was said and done, it was said to be between an F3 and an F4 tornado. You can see the resulting damage from the wind velocity and the different types of tornadoes on this chart. And here we're looking at the F3 and the F4. This animation here gives you a good idea of the difference between an F3 and an F4 tornado. This is the F3 tornado. You'll see photographs like the ones we just looked at that would appear to be more of an F3 uh, tornado and in some future pictures on this video you'll see some that look like it was an F4 tornado. So, so the winds varied as it went along its destructive path and this is the F4 tornado. Before the tornado left the Smith Creek area it found Sherman Stone while he was still on his bulldozer. And Sherman Stone and his bulldozer were lifted 15 or 20 feet into the air, and man and machine returned to Earth safely after a 50-foot flight. From Smith Creek, the tornado took a north-northeast path uh, toward the city of Port Huron. As it made its way toward Port Huron at about 35 miles an hour, and crossed the Ravenswood Road, the home where Charles LaForest lived was right in its path. The family had taken a shelter in the basement and urged Mr. LaForest to come down there with them, but 
He scoffed at that idea. We've never had a tornado in these parts, he says, and he kept standing on the porch. His body was found about 300 feet from where the home once was. The family which took shelter in the basement, of course, were saved. This was the only confirmed death in the Port Sharon area that I'm aware of. The tornado made its way toward Port Sharon, uh, pretty much following the Grizzle Street to cross the railroad yard and took off the roof of the Port Sharon Detroit Roundhouse. The damage to the Roundhouse wasn't the only loss that the railroad suffered. As you can see here, cars were also tipped over, as this photo would attest to with the caboose showing the bottom side up. The tornado continued toward the river, destroying homes and crushing cars with uprooted trees and uh, scattering debris all around. As you can see from these next pictures, Gas stations were hit too, uh, as you can see from this photograph here in the paper that uh, was the gas station on 24th and Pettit, as well as this gas station here on 10th and Griswold Street. Although much damage was done from falling trees on homes and on cars, the biggest damage from uprooted trees was actually to telephone poles. About 80 vehicles and crews were brought in to speed repairs in storm-damaged areas of Port Sharon. Despite all the power lines, there were no telephone crews or power crews uh, that were working on these lines uh, that were injured. Power lines also fell on vehicles with uh, people inside of them, and so there was always that danger as well, but none of those were injured either. Telephone crews worked all weekend and late into the night to repair the uh, fallen lines and the debris that was caught on the lines, as you can see in this picture here. Telephone people recorded a mighty accomplishment at Port Chiron. Service between the storm area and Detroit was never interrupted. Telephone operators timing calls by wristwatches and sorting tickets by flashlights handled the avalanche of traffic that poured through the office all commercial power was off. When the power failed, there were generators that were pressed into service to support them. The man in the inset and the small photograph to your right is F.J. Smith. He describes his 200-foot unscheduled flight aboard his truck in this roaring, twisting tornado. He says, I saw the poles twisting and falling, and this building came flying toward me. I remember seeing it flatten the Dodge next to me. The next thing I remember, the truck had landed on its side, way up the block. And Mr. Smith didn't get a scratch on him. The tornado finally worked its way to the corner of Griswold and uh, Military Street. And you can see the damage that it did on this corner. This would have been the uh, northwest corner. And you can see the Rexville Drug Store in the corner. You can see the Military Fruit Market there to the right and of course the damage being done by the tree that was uprooted. The following video clip is a, a home movie that was shared with me by my friend John Chedister. And here you see that we're on the same corner, only it's in color and moving. So it's kind of neat to be able to see that this way. These flowers you're looking at are in front of the Military Street Fruit Market. And of course here you see the tree that was uprooted that caused all the damage and that's the drugstore there uh, to the left of it. You also see some more of the damage uh, footage that they took of the tornado. And you can also see here some of the uh, cleanup effort that was involved the next day.
And here we have some footage of the Smith Creek area. Remember this photograph here? Well, in a video that Pat Rochette uh, shared with me, we have a little bit of a clip from that same, uh, same area, same picture actually, but only in some video form, so let's take a look at that. I really appreciate these home movies because it's not like today where everybody's walking around with an iPhone taking videos. Uh, movie cameras were quite unique back then and not everyone certainly had one. As a tornado crossed Military Street and went toward the river, uh, we come across this picture right here, which shows the Huron uh, Pipe Company. And that building uh, right here, uh, and then the space next to it, and part of that large building that had part of the roof taken off, that was all Huron Pipe. And then uh, the rest of that large building was warehousing, and that part of the roof was taken off as well. Then if you look to the upper right-hand corner, you'll see lumber scattered all around that area. And that was from Welch, Sash, and Door, so they had a lot of lumber scattered over that area. And the location of this picture was on the corner of Griswold and 4th Street. After that, the tornado hit the St. Clair River and became what they call a water spout. And you can see it right here. A water spout is basically just a tornado over water. And that is what you see in the picture I originally showed you in this video. And as it grew closer to the Sarnia shore, the Sarnia downtown district, the business district, would soon feel the wrath of that tornado. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the damage done to Sarnia, but I do want you to see some of it because it was devastating to the business district and it gives you an idea of the force of that tornado. Before the tornado touched down in Sarnia, people downtown were forced to take cover because of a barrage of hail, golf sized hail, that was hitting the streets. This may sound like a bad thing, but really it was a good thing because it forced people to seek shelter that protected them for the tornado that was yet to come. And the tornado came with full force, as you can see from the following pictures. Here we see one of the landmarks of Sarnia, the Vendome Hotel, and uh, the devastation that the tornado caused to it. And here we see just one corner of a second story. Not sure what this was, but it sure was uh, hit hard by the tornado. Another landmark here fell for the tornado as well, and that was the Imperial Theater. And this is looking from the inside out. There was much damage along the waterfront as well, as you can see by these pictures here.
streets in Sarnia were completely blocked off because of the uprooted and fallen trees. And like in Fort Huron, gas stations didn't escape damage either. There was a very creative uh, gasoline owner when the power failure at Sarnia shut down his electrically driven pumps. Gasoline dealer J.D. Murray didn't let it bother him. He mounted an old bicycle on the pump platform, removed the rear tire, and substituted a V-belt to drive the pump at a rate of three and a half gallons a minute. During the 48-hour blackout, Murray stayed open three hours later each day and pedal pumped 1,450 gallons of gasoline to help motors who couldn't get fuel anywhere else. Remarkably, the tornado remained on the ground and over the water for about three hours, cutting 150-mile swaths from Smith Creek to the outskirts of Stratford, Ontario. Five people died, four in Canada and one in Port Huron. More than 40 people were hospitalized in St. Clair County, and at least 60 more in Sarnia, where the mayor declared martial law. On the Michigan side of the river, 40 homes were destroyed, and nearly 400 sustained significant damage. At least 500 people were left homeless in Ontario. The amazing thing is that most folks in Port Charon, at least in the north end, and even some in the south end, didn't even realize there was a tornado. They just thought it was a bad storm. Even the mayor of Port Huron, who was on the south side of the Black River, uh, didn't realize a tornado had gone through. In 1953, this would have been about the age I would have been at. There I am with my dog Queenie, and that's our home in the background. This was on Michigan Street. My aunt, who lived with us, was more like my sister, got married and was in Philadelphia at the time with her husband. She tried desperately to find out what happened to us, and she kept telephoning us, and of course the lines were all busy, but when she finally got through, she said, well, did you survive the storm? What happened? What about the tornado? Did it do any damage to the house? And our response was, what tornado? Most folks, unless they were actually involved in the tornado or listening to the radio, wasn't aware of the tornado. Just another bad storm. Thankfully, a young photographer that worked for the Porcher and Times Herald by the name of Ralph Polovich was able to take some amazing pictures, one uh, being this one right here. That's the only picture I've ever seen that showed the, the tornado itself. But this one wasn't Ralph's claim to fame. It was this photograph right here taken of Herman Pringle. When Ralph was out on Dove Road, came across Herman's home that was just completely leveled in the storm and saw uh, Herman and his dog and took this prize-winning uh, shot that was uh, selected by the Associated Press as the top news photo in 1953. Quite an honor. He was the youngest photographer ever to receive this prize. If you would like a more in-depth look at this tornado, as well as another tornado that devastated the Jetto area that was the same year, 1953, you might want to consider looking at this DVD. This DVD was produced by St. Clair Risa and gives a wonderful account of this story with, uh, with the survivors uh, telling their stories as well as covering the uh, 1953 storm that went through Jetto. All right, in our next video, we'll mosey our way over to Water Street and work our way west and see what there is to see.